coming up on The World Today. Intelligence, intelligence briefing for the UN says Taliban stepping up search for US and NATO collaborators. US President Joe Biden says American troops may stay in Afghanistan past withdrawal deadline. Plus, Haitian Prime Minister says the country is on its knees after more than 2,000 people were killed in Saturday's powerful earthquake. Hello and a warm welcome to the program. I'm Tenny Ola Shubo Ali. We begin with our coverage of the situation in Afghanistan. A UN document says the Taliban leaders are intensifying their hunt for people who worked for and collaborated with NATO and US forces. The confidential paper was produced by the Norwegian Center for Global Analysis, which provides the UN with intelligence information. Let's take a look at more on this and the developments from the country in this next report. A secret UN document claims the Taliban is intensifying a search for people it believes work with the US and NATO forces, including amongst the crowds at Kabul's airport. The document from a UN threat assessment advisor says there are multiple reports the Taliban have a list of people it wants to question and punish. It also says the Taliban have been going door to door and arresting and or threatening to kill or arrest family members of target individuals unless they surrender themselves. <laughs> Meanwhile, national flag-waving Afghans have been seen protesting in several cities to mark the 102nd anniversary of Afghanistan independence. In Jalalabad, Taliban fighters fired at people waving the Afghan flag during the Independence Day celebrations, injuring a man and a teenage boy. At least two people have also been reported killed after Taliban opened fire at a crowd in Asadabad. It comes as evacuations continue from Kabul airport. Evacuation flights are taking off around the clock, with the U.S. and other nations flying out their citizens and at-risk Afghans. But the Taliban is reportedly now blocking all Afghans, including those with visas, from getting to the tarmac. Taliban fighters control the roads and checkpoints around the airport. A Taliban official says at least 12 people have been killed there since Sunday. In other developments, Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov says that Russia is ready to return to the Moscow format of peace talks on Afghanistan. Moscow format refers to a series of meetings held since 2016 in the Russian capital, with representatives of Afghan parties as well as interested countries taking part. Meanwhile, U.S. President Joe Biden says troops may stay in Afghanistan beyond his planned August 31st withdrawal date to help evacuate Americans. There's been chaotic scenes at Kabul airport as foreign powers seek to get their citizens home. President Biden again defended his handling of Afghanistan, where the Taliban have capitalized on the U.S. pulling out to sweep to power. The commitment holds to get everyone out that, in fact, we can get out and everyone should come out. And that's the objective. That's what we're doing now. That's the path we're on. And I think we'll get there. So Americans should understand that troops might have to be there beyond August 31st. No, Americans should understand that we're going to try to get it done before August 31st. But if we don't, the if, troops will if stay. If we don't, we'll determine at the time who's left. And? And if, there are American force, if there's American citizens left, we're going to stay till we get them all out. Sounds like you think we should have gotten out a long time ago. We should have. And accept the idea that it was going to be messy no matter what. Well, by the way, what would be messy? The if we had gotten out a long time ago, getting out would be messy no matter when it occurred. Your military advisors did not tell you, no, we should just keep 2,500 troops. It's been a stable situation for the last several years. We can do that. We can continue to do that. No, no one said that to me that I can recall. I would have tried to figure out how to withdraw those troops, yes. Because look, George, there is no good time to leave Afghanistan. And do you believe the Taliban have changed? No. I think, let me put it this way. I think they're going through a sort of an existential crisis about do they want to be recognized by the international community as being a legitimate government? I'm not sure they do. But look, they have... They care they, about their beliefs more. Well, they do. 
but they also care about whether they have food to eat, whether they have an income that can make any money and run an economy. They care about whether or not they can hold together the society that they, in fact, say they care so much about. I'm not counting on any of that. Well, the president made those comments on an exclusive interview with CBC News. Well, national security law and foreign policy expert Johanna LeBlanc joins us now for more. Johanna, thank you so much for your time. What do you make of the evacuations taking place now by the United States and other countries uh, for citizens and local support Afghan staff? Certainly, um, um, Timmy, this war has lasted far too long. Um, we're talking about over $2 trillion um, have been spent. Uh, we're talking about over 75,000 Afghan um, military casualties. Uh, we're talking about over 50,000 of Afghanistan citizens who have died as a result of this endless war. So it was a matter of time for uh, America to withdraw and to uh, allow the Afghan people to determine their future. It was time for them to be in control of self-determination. Uh, but the reality is that I believe the execution um, of this withdrawal was somewhat badly planned. Um, this is not a situation where you're dealing with a Taliban knowing uh, the, the, the ideology that drives the Taliban. Um, you don't withdraw so 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 hastily. You take time. You do it one by one, step by step. But nonetheless, it was about time for America to to end this and to to return some of its troops back up to American shores. Um, but again, as I said earlier, I, I think that um, America and and other allies to the Afghan people, all the people on the ground. Um, um, some level of, of support in terms of especially those who are working with those foreign governments to provide assistance, whether it was in the form of um, being an interpreter or whatever the case may have been, because those folks can no longer live in Afghanistan, not under the leadership of the Taliban. Yeah, I guess you agree with the thoughts of that America's allies also bear the responsibility for the uh, chaotic withdrawal. But could America have explored better strategies for uh, troop withdrawal from Afghanistan? I think either way you look at it, um, it was going to be chaotic. And now in foreign policy, there is this idea that we have. Sometimes it's not what you can accomplish per se, but what can be avoided. So I think the collapse of these different cities across Afghanistan um, and, and by the takeover of the Taliban could have been limited um, um, to a certain extent. Uh, but, but however, comma, I think that with the Taliban trying to be recognized as a government must adhere to international norms and international laws. So the question is, will the Taliban do right by the people? Because if the Taliban continues to violate fundamental human rights, there will be sanctions and there will be a limit to foreign assistance. And the people of Taliban, they have to eat, they have to go to school. I'm, I'm sorry, the people of Afghanistan, rather, have to go to school, they have to eat, they have to have a functioning economy. But mm. under sanctions by the United States as well, the U.S.'s allies, it could be incredibly difficult for the Taliban to actually run a country with a thriving economy. Yes, yeah, certainly. Uh, Johanna LeBlanc, national security law and foreign policy expert, thank you so much for your thoughts on the program. Thank you for having me. So on Afghanistan, the EU foreign policy chief has branded developments in Afghanistan a catastrophe and says the evacuation of EU workers is in progress. Addressing two committees of the European Parliament, Joseph Borrell said about 100 EU staff and 400 Afghans working with the EU and their families had been evacuated, but that 300 more Afghans were still trying to leave. Uh, let me let me speak uh, clearly and bluntly. This is a catastrophe. This is a catastrophe for the Afghan people, for the Western values and credibility, and for the developing of international relations. Was it uh, foreseeable? Was it preventable? 
in many cases it's a nightmare because you know even if tonight the first 106 members of our staff of the European Union delegation has landed in Madrid we cannot take all Afghan people out of the country there are still 300 more Afghan staff of the European Union delegations block on the streets of Kabul trying to reach the airport and trying to have a seat on some of the European Union member states flights going to Kabul. These people have loyally promoted and defended European Union interests and values in Afghanistan over many years. It's our moral duty to protect them and to help to save as many people as possible. I've been engaged on this on the last four days and I want to thank also our head of delegation in Kabul who is still there alone. Security analyst David Otto joins us now just to look at the events we've seen over the last couple of days. David, in July, uh, U.S. President Joe Biden predicted that under no circumstance will people be airlifted from Afghan embassy roof. But we've seen the viral images of Afghans fall into their death from a U.S. military plane. The president also said last month the Taliban takeover in the country was highly unlikely. But here we are. Uh, in your assessment, where did it all go wrong? Yes, I think, uh, first of all, the president did commit himself uh, to answering uh, categorical questions. Uh, I don't think he should have answered the way he did. Uh, and you're right. Um, there has been talk of uh, even comparison uh, with uh, what happened in, in Vietnam in the north. Uh, that's in, in, in Saguenay in 1967, when, you know, the U.S. decided to withdraw uh, and the catastrophe uh, that, you know, came with that. Now, there's been a very strong comparison with people saying that uh, the Afghan withdrawal is even worse. So I think, you know, um, you know I think uh, the, the president, you know, may have, you know, uh, misspoke uh, in the sense that uh, when it comes to uh, intelligence, um, you know, there is a difference between that, you know, of your country and that, you know, of the Taliban. So I think uh, the president knew the policy that the U.S. You know, was in for. He understood the strategy. He knew the U.S. tactics. He understood that of the Afghan government. But I think you know, the United States underestimated uh, the strategy and the tactics that the Taliban uh, was using. So I think that is where it went wrong in, in terms of policy. But where it went wrong in terms of strategy is that the United States shouldn't have you know, gone in into the occupation and the regime change policy uh, that it instituted, I think what would have been sufficient uh, would be to do what they said they were going to do, uh, to you know, um, diminish the capacity of, of Al-Qaeda after 9-11 and to punish the Taliban regime for shielding Al-Qaeda. The moment they decided to occupy and stay in, in, in Afghanistan, that was the, uh, the demise of the United States coalition. So, David, what comes next, though, for the Taliban leaders? They've said they will announce a government once foreign forces are completely out of the country. But can the Taliban survive as a legitimate uh, power in Afghanistan and in the face of the international community? I think that's the question uh, that everyone is asking. You know, first of all, you know, nobody knows where, it, uh, where the, uh, the leader is, uh, Haibatullah uh, Munimin, who is um, known as the old mullah. Um, you know, um, people are asking, where is he? Um, but I think the immediate challenge now uh, for the Taliban is consolidation of power. You know, they've overtaken the country. Uh, they've literally brought down the government uh, and the same way that they were brought down. So it's important for them uh, to consolidate power, um, to, you know, maintain some level of law and order. Um, I see the Taliban talking about ensuring that uh, there is no looting, that people are not rioting in the streets, you know, but we've seen that happening. But also, I think what the Taliban would be doing now in terms of PR, as we've seen, is to find friends. Um, you know, China has already opened up its arms and says, you know, listen, we are ready to uh, talk to the Taliban if, if that is the case. Power sharing is one of the issues that the Taliban is going to face. Um, I understand there's a strong resistance, you know, in the valley of, of Punxi, which is in the north. And this has been um, you know, controlled by the vice president who claims that he's in charge, you know, since Ashraf Ghani, the president, has left the country under the constitution. So, um, you know, the president has a lot going on, you know, for them in order to really stabilize the government. 
All right, then, security analyst David Otto, thank you so much for sharing your thoughts and analysis with us on the world today. Thank you. Well, we return in just a moment. Residents get a sweet lockdown respite as Museum of Ice Cream opens its first foreign outlet in Singapore. That's in a moment. Stay with us. Thanks for staying with us. The United Nations says the situation in Ethiopia's Tigray region remains unpredictable and volatile, while movement of Tigray forces in Amara and Afar provinces continue. UN spokesperson Stefan Dejaric says the humanitarian access into the region remains restricted and humanitarian operations severely impacted by lack of supplies. Humanitarian access into the region remains restricted uh, via the only road through Afar region where there, is, uh, where there is insecurity with extended delays for clearance of humanitarian supplies and intense searches of trucks at these checkpoints. Only 30 trucks with humanitarian supplies can be scanned each day under the current procedures. But as we've been telling you, we need 100 trucks of food, non-food items, and fuel needed every day to go into Tigray. Well, let's check in on the situation in Haiti now. Prime Minister Ariel Henry says his country is on its knees after more than 2,000 people were killed in Saturday's powerful earthquake. Mr. Henry says Haiti is physically and mentally devastated. More than 12,000 people have been left injured and 332 are still missing after the 7.2 magnitude quake. There were further tremors late on Wednesday, causing many to rush from their places of shelter into the streets. Haitian officials estimate there are 600,000 people in need of emergency assistance. The delivery of aid has been further hampered by heavy rains brought this week by Tropical Storm Grace. AT has been hit by a series of natural disasters in the past, including Hurricane Matthew in 2016. The deadliest was the 2010 earthquake, which killed more than 200,000 people and caused extensive damage to the country's infrastructure and economy. And now a Nigerian immigrant in the United Arab Emirates, possible Kaoma, is asking other Nigerian youths in the Middle Eastern countries to shun crime and concentrate on working hard. The Abia State indigent currently working as a security guard recently found fame for his musical skills and is now getting help to build a career in music. Our correspondent Mayowa Adegoki has more on this story. Like someone will see you and I know you, I saw you in loving Dubai, you're famous. It's a happy day for Nigerian immigrants in the UAE, possible Ukaoma, whose musical talent has made him Dubai's latest viral sensation. He's amazing. He's amazing. And you were For, telling me you just found out about him. Yeah, and I was honestly mesmerized. Like, I've been here for two years in the same tower. Never did I think, like, we had this talent here. Just walking past, getting coffee, just full on everything stopped. You know, it's breathtaking. A fitness expert who gyms in the same building where possible works as a security officer recorded and sent this video to local media. One post on Instagram and Possible's life story began to change. Is it after five minutes? Different messages and calls were coming from different people that had never sent me a message. <laughs> When I started going for like rounding to check the places in the, in the building, you know, these guys going to the gym, they said, man, I saw you, I saw your picture, your video, you're incredible, man. I, I was like, are you serious? Even that same day, some guys came and they said, man, I want to take pictures with you. I was, I feel so special. However, his reason for immigrating to Dubai is nothing special. Possible, like many other Nigerian youth, came in search of better opportunities. Several failed attempts to get into his dream university of Port Harcourt pushed him to travel out of Nigeria in 2013. 
He now works as a security officer in a commercial building in the heart of Dubai City. Security is a professional job in Dubai, which um, everybody who wants to, to pass through and go for the course. This role may soon change completely as new opportunities in Dubai's music space open up for the Abia State Indigen, who started playing musical instruments in his father's church. For him, there, there are two things that he could look at. One is doing sessions for uh, music composers. So for example, if we're working on a commercial and we need somebody to play the piano, okay? So rather than, you know, get it programmed through the system, through uh, software, we could have him come to the studio and actually do a live session, which is what we do with a lot of uh, uh, musicians. I mean, we have uh, uh, guitarists, we have, uh, you know, saxophonists, people play the clarinet, the violin, who come into the studio and we do a live session whenever we need, say, that little magic, you know, to create a track that really feels right and feels nice. So that's one aspect of it. The other is for him to kind of decide about his own music and his own voice musically. So he could do his own music. The husband and father of one still wishes to get certifications in health and safety. But for now, he is following the call of music. From Dubai in the United Arab Emirates, Mayawa Adigoki for Channels Television. And finally on the program, the Museum of Ice Cream has opened its first international outlet in Singapore, providing some sweet respite for residents as the country eases some coronavirus restrictions. Visitors have to book a time in advance to ensure social distancing requirements are met in the museum. The 60,000 square foot facility follows strict coronavirus guidelines set out by the government, which include compulsory check-ins and showing of vaccination certificates or negative COVID-19 tests for all visitors. When you come into the Museum of Ice Cream, there are many things that you can do besides eating ice cream and exploring our exhibits. I think that it also helps, you know, the creative side of your brain, uh, helps you forget about things. So I definitely do think that it's something that is beneficial, allows you to take a break from things that are happening outside, and it's definitely good for your mental health as well. It's, just, it's great to get out and have exhibitions going on now in Singapore where we can come and enjoy ourselves and, and have fun like this in a day. Actually, even the Bouncy Castle, we had a lot of fun in the Bouncy Castle. We're wearing our masks, but yeah, bouncing off the calories we're using with the ice cream. <laughs> yeah, it's definitely a good break from you know the pandemic and going yeah. out and all that. It's really a, it's a really a good you know place to be. It's happy and you forget about what's happening outside when you're here. definitely looks like a lot of fun and that's the program today thank you so much for watching i'm tenny or lash bye for now